Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Christina Seelander Buzwina, and I'm the Executive Director of the Alliance Francaise here in Minneapolis, St. Paul. I'm also a board member of the Federation of Alliance Francaise Chapters uh, here in the US, and I'm the Honorary Consul of France for the state of Minnesota, South Dakota, and North Dakota. I am delighted to be your host for this event as part of National French Week, a celebration of all things French in schools and communities, and that is organized by our friends at the American Association of Teachers of French. Now more than ever, we're grateful to our teachers for their hard work and dedication in these tumultuous times. Today's event is organized and hosted by the Federation of Alliance Francaise in the United States, and that's a nationwide organization of Alliance chapters across the country. The Federation supports local Alliance chapters in their mission to promote the French language and French speaking cultures. Be sure to check the Federation's website for upcoming nationwide events. This includes Thursday's presentation Uncovering the Secrets and the History of the Paris Metro, and that will be with Charles Coulon, who is Vice President of the Alliance Francaise in DuPage, Illinois, and also my colleague on the Federation Board of Directors. Before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping notes here. Um, we have put you on mute for the initial part of the presentation. And for an optimal experience, we ask that you keep your microphone on mute um, in the question and answer session at the end. If you ask a question, we may ask you to unmute your microphone at that time. Also, we recommend or suggest you set your view option in Zoom to speaker rather than gallery. That way you'll see Marva in addition to the PowerPoint slides. Um, and finally, please feel free to use the chat function of Zoom to enter your comments and any questions you'd like to ask Marva at the end of her presentation. Um, I think that's it for our housekeeping. We're looking at a program of one hour, just to give you a, a little idea of how long we'd like your attention. I'm delighted to introduce our featured speaker, Professor Marva Barnett, author and professor emerita from University of Virginia. She is a true expert on Victor Hugo, and a testament to her passion for Victor Hugo is the sheer shelf space that his canon takes up in her library. Marva's bookshelves hold more than 41 inches of Victor Hugo's work. She has a PhD in Romance Languages and Literatures from Harvard University. Marva also is um, as I said, Professor Emerita at University of Virginia, where she taught for 30 years and hosted many Victor Hugo related events. In 2011, she received the Thomas Jefferson Award for her service, the highest honor the University of Virginia bestows on its faculty. In 2012, the French government named her Chevalier des Pentes Académiques for her work on Hugo. She was recently interviewed by Arte, the French television network, for their series, L'Aventure des Manuscrits. So be sure and check that next year when it airs. Earlier this year, Professor Barnett's latest book was released by Swan Isle Press. To Love is to Act, Les Miserables, and Victor Hugo's Vision for Leading Lives of Conscience. Marva and her publisher have generally, generously extended a 30% discount on her book for all of you participating in today's talk. You should have received the promo code in the email confirmation with your registration, which also had the Zoom connection information. If you need the code again, please don't hesitate to reach out to Melissa Soha, our fantastic national program administrator. By the way, Melissa is the only staff member at the Federation and is truly a one woman show, supporting leaders from more than 100 Alliance Francaise chapters across the country. And today she's helping manage technology. Uh, merci infiniment, Melissa, for tout ton aide. Okay, aimer c'est agir. Those were words Victor Hugo wrote three days before he passed away. As one of the most well known and widely read French authors, Hugo's not only a novelist, but also a playwright and above all, a poet. 
Les Miserables is considered to be one of the greatest novels of the 19th century, or perhaps of all time. It treats matters of poverty and classism, justice, with its compelling and vivid characters. But Professor Barnett, 135 years after Victor Hugo's death, why should we continue to read him today? What relevance does his message or his philosophy have in our modern world? And what does it really mean to lead a life of conscience? Can you tell us more? Thank you. Yes, Christina, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And thanks to all of you for coming today. I'm very excited to talk to you about my fascination with Hugo's work, especially as you said, Christina, how he put into practice the last words he wrote, aimer c'est agir. So we can do away with the PowerPoint at this point and I'll just talk to you as people. Um, I'm, I'm also going to be talking about how his approach resonates today in the words and deeds of modern activists and thinkers. I very much look forward to your comments and questions after I finish talking. And I, I'm sure that some of you are teachers and I think you'll be happy to know that um, it was my students who prompted me to write this book. They, in my courses, both courses I taught on Victor Hugo and on Les Miserables, at the University of Virginia, I found that they often said how uplifted they were in reading Les Miserables. They also felt somewhat uplifted by the musical as well. And the musical often brought them to my course. So I, I wondered how can such a tragic story bring so many people so much hope and optimism? So I wanted to look in more depth about the power of Hugo's epic and um, the, I found myself researching and writing and also talking with some of the artists who had created that award-winning musical. Working on my book quickly brought me to those last words of Victor Hugo, aimer c'est agir. And that maxim comes through in many of the most moving parts of Les Miserables. And I very much appreciate that Hugo gave me the title of my book as well. His maxim encapsulates um, you know, how he lived his life and how he wrote Les Miserables. And I believe that in saying that, in writing that, he's saying when we care about something or someone, we do something about it. We're motivated by our love. So I had begun my adventure of exploring Les Miserables by wanting to write to fans of Les Mis, as I like to call the musical. But the more I learned about Hugo and his life, the more I delved deeply into his unforgettable characters in this epic novel, the more I realized that I was writing, as Christina said, to people who think about how to live a good life, a life of love and conscience. I'm impressed by Hugo's humanity and by sensitivity to human foibles and challenges and overall his optimism about our potential and all of this despite the many sad events in his life, assuming, I don't know how much you know about Hugo, but a very quick survey of some of the, 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 the saddest notes. His parents were incompatible in the, soon after they married, they realized they were and they, and they divorced when he was young. His brother and then his younger daughter both had major mental breakdowns from which they never recovered. When Hugo was about 28, he realized that his wife and his best friend were having a love affair. And they stayed together um, and raised four children, but their oldest and most beloved daughter, Leopoldine, as many of you no doubt know, drowned at age 19. Hugo never really got over that. And around that time, he threw himself into an affair with a married woman that brought them both public shame. Getting over that, he found, found himself driven into political exile when he very ardently resisted the coup d'etat on December 2nd, 1851. Spent 19 years in political exile. He lived through two revolutions and the deadly famine during the Prussian siege of Paris. In the end, Hugo's wife, all but one of his children, and his friend, lover, and muse of 50 years died before he did, and he was left alone with his beloved, two beloved grandchildren, at least. 
Yet, despite such tragedies, or maybe because of such tragedies, I mean, do we really know what motivates people? Hugo had a powerful capacity for empathy. He did what he could to, to work for, to help life be better for people. And in his writing and, and his artwork as well, he inspires us to do the same. First of all, he prompts us to really see other people something that Hugo, the writer and the artist must have been exceptionally good at. He certainly spent a lot of time walking the streets of Paris and observing things. We see, we get a sense of the levels of his op observational skill and his empathy in a journal entry that many people believe inspired Les Miserables. I thought, I had thought it inspired Les Miserables. And then I looked, <laughs> I did a simple thing. I looked at the dates and discover that he had begun Les Miserables about three, over three months before he wrote this journal entry. But it is, it's a powerful piece. I'm gonna read you part of it um, from the beginning of my chapter one. On February 22nd, 1846, Hugo wrote, it was a beautiful, very cold day, despite the, midnight, the midday sun. I was coming down the Rue de Tournon in Paris. I saw coming down that, route, that street a man being led by soldiers. The man was blonde, pale, thin, distraught. He was about 30, wearing rough canvas pants. His naked scraped feet and wooden clogs had bloody, bloody scraps of cloth wrapped around his ankles to make do as socks. His short peasant smock, muddy down the back, showed that he regularly slept outdoors. He was hatless, with bristling hair. Under his arm, he had a loaf of bread. People were saying that he had stolen the bread and that was why they were taking him away. So Hugo continues and tells how he watched the blonde man and noticed what he was watching, a large, elegant carriage emblazoned with a ducal crown. Through its open window, they could see a dazzlingly beautiful woman in black velvet, sitting on a seat upholstered in yellow damask. Laughing, she played with a charming toddler who was tucked up in ribbons, lace, and furs. So Hugo continued in his journal. This woman did not see this dreadful man who was looking at her. I stood there locked in thought. For me, this man was no longer a man. He was the specter of wretchedness. He was in full daylight, in sunlight, the deformed dismal apparition of a revolution still plunged in shadows, but on its way. Once this man perceives that this woman exists and the woman does not perceive that the man is there, catastrophe is inevitable. With his simple journal observation, Hugo shows us that conscience begins with seeing, and seeing should lead to caring. On that cold day, Hugo sees people's lives both as they are and as they should be. The desperate man unhappily sees too. The wealthy woman does not even try. Each person presents a dilemma of conscience that is just as relevant to us today. If I were in this scene, I'd be one of the financially lucky ones. The woman in the carriage most likely parked in my car, engrossed in a national public radio story. What if we are that bystander? Are we paying attention to others' lives and caring about what we see? If not, what will open our eyes to misery around us? Or what if we are the hungry man? Would we steal the bread? In either case, being either person, what does our conscience tell us to do? Suppose, on the other hand, we are as observant as Hugo. Even without Hugo's insight and writing skill, I hope I'd be puzzling over what underlies the man's thinness and troubled demeanor. If that destitute, probably homeless man stole the bread, as everyone says, he made the wrong decision. No matter how hungry he is, he doesn't have the right to steal. But that makes me wonder, how can people who were born in poverty 
or who lack education and personal connections, or who have just had a run of bad luck, how can they pull themselves back up? Can I do anything to help individuals before or even after they've fallen so far? Or can I do something to move other people or society towards helping more? That is Hugo's point in Les Miserables, where he shows the humanity that such people have. Gavroche, Eponine, Fantine, Jean Valjean. We need to really see each other and respond to what we see. Of course, Hugo does not have all the answers. Even though he understands this distraught man's plight, for instance, he cannot undo his crime, release him from the soldiers, or remake his life. What Hugo does, however, is raise our awareness of misery in the world and exhort us to do what we can. He brings Les Miserables to life in ways that encourage us to feel concern for these wretched people, even knowing that they are fictional. So from what such caring, from such love, grow Hugo's guiding principles, and they are what drive the essays in To Love is to Act. So I'd like to give you an overview of the book by showing you a few of the illustrations and chapter openers. And so we'll see a few more slides here. So and here is the manuscript, which I'm very happy to have been able to include in my book. This is Hugo writing Aimé Cetagir uh, while he was um, in bed with um, pulmonary congestion that, and the, that killed him three days later. To love is to act. And one way that Hugo put love into action was, you'll see in the next slide, offering healthy lunches to children on the island of Gurji. So we can, we can have the next slide, please. So you see Hugo in the white hat. He had read that children would be much healthier if they could have meat and wine, interesting thought, uh, once a week. And so at the time in spring of 1862, at the time Les Miserables was being published, he and his wife Adele, who's not pictured here, and the, uh, their staff began offering weekly lunches to um, about 10 or 12 Guernsey children whom you see here while they were in exile. They did this every week for the next eight years, going up to where they, and you would invite children, they would invite children they saw on the street, as many as 40, 45, all, the, all they could find. So that was one of his actions prompted by love. From that place of love, we can do a lot. The next slide shows that from a place of love, we can forgive. This is a still from the 2012 film, the moment when Bishop Muriel has already forgiven Jean Valjean, played here by Hugh Jackman, for stealing his silver place settings and is giving um, the silver candlesticks, which was the last pos valuable possession, the last possession the bishop had from his former, former regular life life. From that place of love, we can also open ourselves up to change. Next slide. The bishop didn't have a complete impact on Jean Valjean. This is, um, this is the film with Jean Gabin um, showing a moment we often don't see and, and is not and is not included in the musical where Valjean unthinkingly steals um, a, a very tiny coin from this chimney sweep and then realizes what he has become and launches himself toward his re redemption. The next slide shows that from a place of love and connected to our sense of love is following our conscience. I love this drawing by Hugo, conscience in, in the face of a bad action, find it very alive and, um, and, and moving for me. So conscience tells us what is morally right, obviously, and what is morally right, Hugo argued, is often not the same thing as what's legal. So in the next slide, you'll see the, um, chapter that I could li like to call either Valjean or Javert, the line from the musical. This is the confrontation scene from in with Inspector Javert at Colm Wilkinson as Valjean in the original Broadway production, where we see um, in this chapter, I talk about how important, immensely important it was to Victor Hugo to confront immoral legalities, things that are legal but are immoral as Jean Valjean is always doing what's right in the face of 
Javert's absolute fixation on the law, whether it's right or wrong. Hugo cared a lot about a lot of issues. The two that I'd like to show you in the next slide, you'll see the first of two drawings of Hugo's drawings against the death penalty. He had an absolute horror of execution, found the death penalty to be, death penalty to be an immoral law. This one is called Ecce Lex in Latin. Both these titles are in Latin. In Latin, behold the law, which of course echoes the words of Pontius Pilate. And then the next, uh, next slide shows the effect of the guillotine. And if you look closely at the bottom of this um, painting, in effect, drawing painting, you'll see that Hugo has written justicia, justice, in Latin, in the blood of the guillotine person in the paving stones. But still, despite the horrors that are out there in the world, um, despite these challenges, if we're motivated by love and conscience, as Hugo was in exile, and as young Gavroche is, for instance, in Les Miserables, we can find the strength to carry on. And there's one more slide in this set. Here you have Gavroche. I love this. this is the more charming, in my opinion, of the two drawings that Victor Hugo did of Gavroche. And so it's nice to end with this slide at this point, and we can stop the slides now. Because today I'd like to focus on Victor Hugo's belief in forgiveness and resilience, as we see in Gavroche, and also in his belief that our caring for others activates our conscience to help us distinguish what's moral from what's legal. Of course, many characters in Les Miserables are archetypes, but for me and for many readers, they are individuals too. I really wish I could sit down and have a cup of tea with Bishop Muriel. I would love to, to meet him. He seems real to me. But of course, he's the epitome of love and forgiveness. He's not real in that sense. And, 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 he's, and, he's, and in fact, Hugo comments in the novel that the bishop had, and I quote, an excess of love, a serene benevolence going beyond humans and even including inanimate objects. That's, that's the quote. And, and in fact, he tells how the bishop sprained his ankle once in his garden so that he would, have, because he wanted to avoid stepping on an ant and not, and not hurt the ant. Hugo tells us that, quote, serious people believe that this excess of love makes the bishop vulnerable. But of course it doesn't. It makes him admirable and it makes him forgiving. The bishop sees the human being in the ex-convict, the felon Jean Valjean, and when he forgives him, he launches Valjean on that road to a life, to redemption and a life of love and conscience. Even before Jean Valjean becomes mayor of Montreuil-sur-Mer, he is carrying on the bishop's habit of generosity. He leaves his house with his pockets full of money, comes back in the evening with them empty, having given it all away. And he gives us many examples of forgiveness, including risking his safety by saving a man who hated him from being pinned under his cart, the famous scene from Les Miserables where Valjean gets under the cart all by himself and lifts it off Fauchelevent, who has never, who has never liked the mayor, right in front of Inspector Javert, just, just then hinting to Javert that he might indeed be the, the ex-convict that, that, that they're looking for. And then Ultimately, of course, Valjean forgives Inspector Javert when he's caught as a spy at the barricade and where he could quite legitimately have been executed given the, the revolutionary um, situation. So Hugh Jackman played you know, Jean Valjean in the movie and he talked with me for my book about that scene, the scene at the barricades where instead of executing Inspector Javert, Valjean releases him. And Hugh's analysis reminded me of how love and mercy interconnect. Here's what Hugh Jackman said. So I played that moment when I let him go of actually loving Javert by seeing the humanity in him. The music is so beautiful at that point. Valjean says, there's nothing that I blame you for. You've done your duty, nothing more. That's all Valjean says, and I believe he really meant that. And there he releases that ghost of Javert. Victor Hugo knew what psychologists tell us, 
that forgiveness can benefit the forgiver and usually does even much more than the person who is forgiven. And that power of loving forgiveness is all around us. You might remember the shooting at the Emanuel AME Church in South Carolina in 2015 and how a, a, a number of the family members of the people who were tragically killed that day forgave the shooter. Victor Hugo himself envisioned forgiveness writ large. And I very much like the opening lines of the penultimate poem that he includes in L'Art d'être grand-père, the art of being a, grand, a grandfather. The poem is called Fraternité, Fraternity. And he's addressed it quite explicitly to his two grandchildren to be read when they are grown up. He wrote, I dream of equity, of profound truth, of love that wills, Hope that, grow, hope that glows, faith that heals, and the people's enlightenment, not punishment. I dream of kindness, goodness, pity, and vast forgiveness. Hence, my solitude. Hugo is indeed often isolated in his efforts to promote clemency around the world, including writing a letter to the U.S. government um, arguing that John, the abolitionist John Brown should not be executed, and writing to try to save Emperor Maximilian from being executed in Mexico after the revolution. Hugo eventually succeeded in getting amnesty for the Paris Communard insurrectionists, for instance. And Victor Hugo's lifelong battle for amnesty and against the death penalty and for rehabilitation rather than cruel punishment, they made him a hero to the underdog, but it made him anathema to many in power. Especially striking are parallels between Hugo's view of clemency as a moral position and Archbishop Desmond Tutu's insights about his South African Commission on Truth and reconciliation. Both men believe that we always need to pay attention to others' humanity, and they saw how interdependent we are. So I'd like to read you just one page about that. It's mostly quotes. Victor Hugo would have agreed with Nobel laureate Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who knew how forgiveness opens the way to new beginnings. He said, Retribution leads to a cycle of reprisal, leading to counter reprisal in an inexorable movement, as in Rwanda, Northern Ireland, and in the former Yugoslavia. The only thing that can break that cycle, making possible a new beginning, is forgiveness. Without forgiveness, there is no future. Archbishop Tutu expanded the meaning of justice when he explained why South Africa had rejected the models of both the Nuremberg trials post-World War II and the blanket amnesty of General Pinochet's Chile. He wrote, our country chose a middle way of individual amnesty for truth. Some would say, what about justice? And we say retributive justice is not the only kind of justice. There's also restorative justice because we believe in Ubuntu, the essence of being human, the idea that we are all caught up in a delicate network of interdependence. We say a person is a person because of other persons. I need you in order to be me and you need me in order to be you. Parallels between Archbishop Tutu's perspective and Hugo's are striking. Hugo, in his May 1876 Senate speech for amnesty, recognized people's interdependence, and he contended, con contended that clemency is a higher level of justice, not the sort of legalistic justice that the term sometimes implies and that Hugo found to be too often inhumane. And here's a quote from that speech. Clemency is none other than justice rendered more just. Justice sees only the offense. Clemency sees the offender. With justice, the offense appears in a sort of inexorable isolation. With clemency, 
the offender, offender appears surrounded by innocent people. He has a mother, father, children, wife, all of whom are condemned with him and suffer his punishment. He is imprisoned in a labor camp or in exile. They are in poverty. Did they merit punishment? No. Did they undergo it? Yes. So clemency finds justice unjust. Clemency intervenes and offers mercy. Mercy is the sublime correction that justice from above bestows on justice from below. So as he indicates here, Hugo found that mercy comes directly from God, what he also called the universal spirit, and so do love and conscience. In the conclusion to his book-length poem that he called Dieu, God, Hugo concludes, God has only one face, light, and only one name, love. And throughout Les Miserables, he connects conscience with God, as in this quote from the book from near the end, where he says, we are never done with conscience, since conscience is bottomless, being God. Today we face this moral versus legal question, and I would say off the top of my head, sort of a lot of different situations, the unequal rate of conviction for Black Americans um, and the number of Black Americans in prison, some of the disputes over immigration at our borders, the continued existence of the death penalty, those are the ones that pop first into my mind. And I was intrigued by reading about Alabama attorney Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson shows us numerous cases where legal maneuvering overwhelmed moral decisions in his best-selling book, just Mercy, also a film that I, that I thought was extremely good as well. I was struck by how powerfully Stevenson, like Hugo, again makes a case for seeing people's humanity. In Just Mercy, Stevenson focuses on the case of Walter McMillan, who was railroaded for a murder he knew absolutely nothing about, and we follow through how that happened and how, with the help of Stevenson and his staff, he was finally vindicated. But beyond the specifics of the criminal justice system, Stevenson explicitly links true justice with mercy. Mercy is a, ri a rich word, including, of course, ideas of both compassion and a disposition to forgive. And Stevenson writes, mercy is just when it is rooted in hopefulness and freely given. Mercy is most empowering, liberating, and transformative when it is offered to the undeserving. Stevenson's here pinpointing, obviously, the link between mercy and grace. And like Hugo knows that to be truly human, to be truly just, we must be humane and act fairly toward everyone. Working with so many people who've been so unfairly treated, Stevenson concludes powerfully, I think, he wrote, I've come to believe that the true measure of our commitment to justice, the character of our society, our commitment to the rule of law, fairness, and equality cannot be measured by how we treat the privileged, the well-to-do, the respected, and powerful among us. The true measure of our character is how we treat the poor, the disfavored, the accused, the incarcerated, and the condemned. Victor Hugo went even farther, declaring, the rights of all the weak make up the duties of all the strong. Embodied in that question of what's moral versus what's legal then is again, our capacity to care for others. That ability to love also gives us remarkable resilience. And of course, Jean Valjean is resilient, but I really wanted to talk with you today about Gavroche. You probably know Gavroche, even if you haven't read the novel. The street urchin who was abandoned by his parents, the truly evil Thénardier. He has essentially nothing. Gavroche is 12, 13. We're not too sure how old he is. But he is, Hugo tells us, joyous because he is free. Gavroche is a true delight. He provides at times comic relief to the novel, but he's also a role model of generosity and resilience. 
It's a November sleety, rainy day, and he gives his one warm piece of clothing to a teenage girl who's shivering in, her, in a skirt that's too short. And then he picks up two little boys that, that are lost in the streets, and he, he uses his last sou to buy a piece of bread and then gives them the bigger pieces. In working on my book, I was surprised and, of course, impressed to see that Gavroche's sources of resilience are very often those recommended by modern psychologists. Two that I focused on, to focus on Into Love is to Act are Viktor Frankl and Adam Grant. The Austrian neuro neurologist and psychiatrist Viktor Frankl, you may have read his book, I recommend it highly, Man's Search for Meaning, made a lot of difference to me in college. He was imprisoned in several Nazi, con Nazi concentration camps, and he survived because he had a breakthrough realization, as he tells us in the book. Everything can be taken from a person but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. And I ran into Adam Grant, who's an organizational psychologist, when I read a book that he wrote with Sheryl Sandberg about how she found joy, ways to build resilience and find joy after her 47-year-old husband died suddenly and unexpectedly from heart failure. Their book is called Option B, and there they explore how reaching out to others helps people not only survive grief, but also have personal growth that they call post-traumatic growth. So what's the connection with Gavroche? And let me read you about Gavroche taking these two little boys home with him. And here's a, we've got a couple more slides right here. The first is Gavroche's home. This Leaky, it was much more decrepit when Gavroche lived there than this artist's illustration in, in an edition of Les Miserables shows you. It was leaky, it was falling apart, it, it was looked quite like um, Tom Hooper made it look in the 2012 film, if you've seen that, uh, when Gavroche lived there. But this shows the enormous size of this planned monument that Napoleon was going to put up to himself at the Place de la Bastille. And this slide you can look at while I read you this couple of paragraphs from my chapter eight, Finding Strength to Carry On, the next slide. The next slide shows us the scene that I'm going to read you about. There's Gavroche with the two little boys. They're now inside that elephant. Gavroche easily scrambles up the elephant's leg through a hole into its belly and then helps the boys climb a rope. Inside, Gavroche continually draws on his sense of humor and as Victor Frankl recommends, he chooses how to think about the situation. Mocking his strange abode, Gavroche jokes with his guests, let's begin by telling the porter we're not at home, as he pulls a plank over the hole. He goes on to show us a great deal about how to remain resilient using techniques that reflect what experts today recommend. Gavroche makes the best of what he has in effect, employing Sandberg and Grant's option B technique. For instance, Gavroche has fabricated that tent to protect himself from drips and from the thousands of rats who've taken up residence in the rotting structure. He reduces or eliminates his own discomfort by empathizing with the five-year-old who is frightened by hearing the rats gnawing at the tent. Calming the little boy by telling him, oh, they're just mice, Gavroche encourages him to hold his hand passing on, as Hugo explicitly tells us, his, quote, courage and strength. Gavroche also uses what um, my husband and I like to call the bright side Barnett technique. It kind of gets on my husband's nerves, but I'm, I can't help myself. Bright side Barnett technique is a version, I, I learned, of Sandberg and Grant's focusing on worst case scenarios. When something goes wrong, it can help us gain perspective to recognize how things could be worse. So hearing the boys worry that it's dark inside the elephant, Gavroche makes the point that because they have a candle, being inside the elephant is better than being outside where it is seriously dark and where they would be much more uncomfortable in the rain and the cold. And we can end the slideshow now. 
Even if you hesitate to read the brilliant thousand plus pages of Le Miserable, if you haven't already had that great pleasure, I really encourage you to read the sections about Gavroche, his compassion and his incredible joy and resilience are a lot of fun to read about and incredibly inspiring. Like the other Les Miserables Mis characters, Gavroche shows us that love is key to our humanity. And Victor Hugo tells us that love is indomitable and cannot be lost. He makes, he emphasizes the point that we can't lose our humanity in this quote near the end of, from near the end of Les Miserables by using a word that's equally rare in French and English, the same word in both languages, a new word to me, inamissible, there's no D, inamissible. So here, I'll take a sip of water and I'll give you the quote. Hugo wrote that we all have within us inalienable humanity, inamissible human feeling, that splendid phenomenon, perhaps the finest of all our inner marvels. Love connects us together and prompted by conscience, love pushes us to do our best despite our shortcomings, despite other people's shortcomings. So I wanted, couldn't think of a better way to end than to leave you with uh, some of Jean Valjean's last words to Cosette and Marius in which he passes on to them the love and sustenance that he received from Bishop Muriel. Valjean says to them, love each other always deeply. There's scarcely anything else in the world but that, to love one another. Thank you all for coming and listening and please let's talk. Thank you so much, Marva. That was fantastic. It was very insightful for me. Thanks. Does anyone have any questions? I haven't seen any in the chat so far. Um, if you do, uh, please go ahead and type it in. Um, I guess while we're waiting, I do have a, a question. Um, Marva, what do you think distinguishes Victor Hugo from other authors? Oh, lots of things. Thanks. Good, that's a great question. What really entranced me when I first read Notre Dame de Paris, The Hunchback of Notre Dame as a teenager, was his poetic prose, his style. And in fact, my students, when in my course on Les Miserables, we read the novel over a semester in English. It was a, a university seminar for first year students um, most of the time and met only for two hours a week. So we would read and students would often raise their hands and say, do you mind? I'd just like to read you this sentence or this paragraph. It is just so beautiful. And I said, no, I don't mind reading you aloud. And so then his undying commitment, his, his, his um, commitment to being an écrivain engagé is very powerful and meaningful to me. He inspired me to be involved in a presidential campaign when I, years and years ago when I was first working on Hugo. And I never thought that I would do such a thing. And it was because, you know, he cared about things, he did things about them. He very inspirational in that way. And I feel, this is a strange thing to say, apparently people think, but in fact, when I read Hugo more than anybody else, I feel like there is an alive person talking to me. I think it comes in part from his sense that he expressed in the preface to, to Les Contemplations when he said something like, um, you're crazy, you complain, you know, you're all complaining. He was writing as a romantic, uh, he'd been a romantic, and he said, you complain that romantics talk about themselves all the time, but that's just crazy. When I talk about me, I'm talking about you. Mm -hmm. Very much of what Desmond Tutu said, you are me, I am you. And I think he brings that personal commitment to his writing. He also injects himself into the story sometimes. I love it when he says, and this, the, uh, the person who is telling you the story wrote about this in a novel called Claude Gueux, which he did. I like that, he's alive. So all those reasons and more. Good, that's very insightful, thank you. On that note, is there an individual, such as a teacher or a social movement that really influenced Victor Hugo to see humanity in all people? That question is from James. Is there, yeah, people did influence him and I'm not, I'm not gonna be able to pull this out of my memory banks. Um, 
at the, you know, off the top of my head, but um, yes, so he, he was, he was listening to people. I think I'm not, I don't want to name a name in case I'm going to be wrong about it. So um, names are flying around in my head, but I'm not sure, you know, um, there's no one person. Uh, one thing about he, that, that my sense of Hugo is that um, less than some authors, he, he read, but he doesn't seem to have been influenced. He was the leader of the period. So other influence, other authors who were younger than him were you know, either followed him and admired him or admired him and then didn't like him or fought against him. But he was, um, he was influenced by various thinkers and social and social thinkers and, um, and some philosophers, but um, I'm, I'm not going to come up with the names off the top of my head. We have several questions, so that's okay. We will just move on. Uh, let's see, there are a couple that are linked, so I'll try and make those um, Thank you. Let's see. Anne asks, how would you relate Victor Hugo's philosophy to the political crisis we are in today? And then similarly, Diane wonders, how has your work on this book informed your current experience in our country? So. Oh. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, they're related. Um, the humanity we have a divided nation. This is, I mean, to me, and, and all, there are many, many, many concerns uh, in the world right now and in, in the United States right now, but a nation divided against itself cannot stand has popped into my head in, you know, since the election, at the time of the election and since. The, the fact of the number of votes is, is, is striking. And so that there's so many people and that the divide has become so big. Seeing each other's humanity um, seeing that everybody has foibles and, and challenges and, um, and, and thinking that way, I think I, that's what I'm channeling now. So that actually, I guess, answers, that's my main answer to the second question. Right, working on this book has really brought me to an understanding of forgiveness. I, I watched just last night a documentary that I just discovered about the Emmanuel AME Church and what happened there, 75 minute documentary in which you see these church members forgive the shooter for having killed their mothers in many cases. It was a Bible study group. And um, the power of the release that comes from forgiving. And if we could forgive a lot of past things, if we could, I've also more and more thought that um, the, the power, the power and the progress that comes from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which I entered, you know, in a new way because I was working, I mean, entered that idea in a new way because of To Love Is To Act, is probably something that we should seriously consider in the U.S. So those are two of my ideas in the present moment. Um, are you muted? I think you're muted. Sorry about that. A couple more questions. Um, on Victor Hugo and, and his political or social causes and beliefs. Um, for the 1871 commune, what was his position? And then separately, after writing to an American newspaper against the killing of John Brown, did Victor Hugo have any influence in the anti-slavery movement in the US? But that was also happening in France and Europe. Um, so two different questions on his involvement. In let me let me answer the slavery one that popped into my head. It's a shorter answer, maybe. Um, he did write to um, so Hugo in exile. Hugo is in exile from 1851 until 1870 until the uh, Napoleon III left in, in September of 1870. He wrote letters around the world. People sought his his comments and. Um, and he wrote the John Brown letter, which was addressed to the government and published in a newspaper on his own. I, I, don't, think that, I don't think that was sought, but other um, abolitionist groups sought his comments. I don't know whether he had any impact. He tried to have impact. He wrote anti-slave letters and proclamations against slavery around the world, as you said, Christina, while in exile in the, in the 1860s, primarily. He had a very mixed... Um, 
feeling about the, the Paris Communard insurrectionists. I spent a lot of time trying to tease that out for myself. He agreed with some of their goals, many of their goals to make you know, life better for the average person and that kind, of, that kind of thing. He really disagreed with the violence of their actions and he did not support the Paris Commune, which makes it all the more powerful. I tell this story in um, the Why Forgive chapter, it makes it so powerful that, um, so, as the Paris Commune, as the insurrection started, Hugo's son, older son Charles, had an, died of apoplexy in the in Bordeaux. I think he was in the south of France. They brought him back. He, all these family members, aside from Hugo, who's in the Pantheon, of course, they're in Père Lachaise Cemetery. So they were doing Charles's funeral in Père Lachaise when the Commune broke out. And so Hugo, you know, but but the but they let they parted to let they said, oh, it's Victor Hugo. We just let let this happen. And then he had to go to Brussels to take care of Charles's estate. And from his home in Brussels, he offered amnesty to the any the fleeing communal who were being gunned down. Uh, you know, you may have seen the monument in Père Lachaise where they were just you know where they were just mowed down, and many National Guard members were killed. It was a very bloody. Thing. So he offered them amnesty and then he continued to fight and it was in the 18, late 1870s, 18, late 1870s, I believe, I don't have the date in my mind, when they did finally grant amnesty, something like eight to ten years after the commune and let the communal who were still alive come back from exile. Thank you. Got several very interesting questions. A um, couple literary questions, if we can do two or three at a time again. Um, could you comment on the book Victor Hugo Vient de Mourir by Judith Perignon? Uh, we have Armando who's reading it as part of a French course. Cool. And then another uh, participant asked if you could compare Victor Hugo with Charles Dickens. Okay, so the Victor Hugo Vient de Mourir, I really enjoyed it. But it's just a journalist who is fictionalized and did a lot of research um, about Victor Hugo at, at the time Victor Hugo died. And then really it's about the political conflict and arguments and battles around his funeral. And because you know, it was because of Victor Hugo and all of this work, the kind of thing I've been talking about and his contributions to the French Republic that the Republican side of the, the country wanted to deconsecrate Saint Genevieve Church, which had been deconsecrated under the revolution and reconsecrated as a Catholic church. And they did decide in the end to make it what is now the Pantheon, that building, no longer a Catholic church and bury the great men and now women with Simone Weil of, of France, inter them in the Pantheon. So that conflict and the different um, the socialists and the anarchists and the Parti de l'Ordre and all the different people and how they're pulling and pushing are come to life in that little book. So I don't know how accurate it is. I do know that she did a lot of research. Lots of interesting, with Dickens, many interesting parallels. Really, they were aiming, it seems, to Hugo, you know, explicitly in his epigraph says, as long as the three problems of the century exist for men, women, and children, books such as, books like this one cannot be useless. This book is a, a, a book to inspire and educate, and, and Charles Dickens was doing the same thing. Dickens did come and visit Hugo. At the in his in what is now the Maison de Victor Hugo and the Place des Vosges, and uh, thought he was very quote very interesting from head to toe. He didn't say a lot about him, and I don't I never I haven't found anywhere where Hugo talks about Dickens. Interesting. Well, we're almost out of time. We yeah. do have a couple other questions. How was Hugo influenced by religion, and what about the American philosopher Thoreau? and the belief that the state isn't always moral. Would you speak to those briefly as we <laughs> wrap up here? No wonder I like, I'd forgotten that quote from Thoreau. I love Thoreau as well. I have to go back. Thank you, read that. Um, I don't know of any connections between Thoreau and Hugo. Uh, so let me go to that immense question. <laughs> How is Hugo affected by religion? I mean, what do we have? Um, a minute and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Uh, oh my gosh. 
Well, okay, bottom line, bottom line, um, Hugo was, a, um, as an adult, Hugo rarely went to church. His children were married in church. He was, as far as anyone knows, never baptized. They had to finagle the paperwork for him and Adele to marry in the church. So he married in the church. But in the end, the older he got, and, and I, I said in my, in my talk, I mentioned he calls, he uses the word je a lot, but he also calls it, calls this, this thing, l'infini, l'esprit universel. He has many words that echo for me with Eastern religious thought. And I did explore his library at Oatville House on Guernsey. It's a wonderful place to visit. If you get a chance, they've completely renovated the house. I haven't seen it yet because of the pandemic. Can't wait. Beautiful. Hugo did the interior decor there. But he had a library. So he was there in Guernsey for 15 years in exile. And in his library, he had a number of books about different religions of the world. And when the bishops avoid stepping on the ant, there's a sense of, and, and Hugo is explicit in some of his poetry about reincarnation. In the end, in his long poem called Religion and Religions, he says all, and in Dieu, he shows that all established, no established religion is, is a good thing. It's, it's there, they get in the way between the person and God. So Hugo had a lifelong search for understanding what this power beyond us. He always believed in what we tend to call God. He always believed in this power, but he didn't reach that power through established religion, including Catholicism. Wonderful. Well, I wish we had time for several more questions, but Professor Barnett, thank you so much for this beautiful talk and this really thoughtful um, reflection on Victor Hugo and society today and, and um, living a, a, conscious, a conscientious life. So it's, it's really been a pleasure listening to you. Thank you to all of our participants from Elios Frances chapters across the country and AATF friends as well. Um, and please stay tuned for upcoming events with the Federation, our national organization of Elios Frances chapters. So